I cannot deny what I've seen I've got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind This is so long to my old friends Those burdens and bitterness You can't just keep it moving on You're not welcome here Lost another one, I am free. Oh, I am free. Yes, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. Yes, I am free. Yes, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. Yes, I am free. Yes, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. Yes, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Yes, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Yes, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Yes, I am free. I am free. Sing, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, 
get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave.
Cause there is resurrection power When we sing the name of Jesus Resurrection power When we raise a mighty sound Come on, let the praise get loud Make that empty grave resound There is resurrection power in His name There are days I have seen Full of heartache and loss That have buried my heart Beneath their weight Oh, but every time His praise breaks out Dead things rise up from the ground I won't leave my song Inside that empty grave There is resurrection power Resurrection power When we raise a mighty sound Come on and the praise get loud Make that into great resound There is resurrection power In His name There is resurrection power When we sing the name of Jesus Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound, come on, let the praise kick it loud. Make that empty grave a resound. There is resurrection power in His
want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus oh I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing your name is life. You break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains And Jesus in the streets And Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus Oh shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is alive. You break every stronghold. Shadows burn like a fire. Oh, your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Oh, your name is light. Shine through the Burn like a fire Oh, shout Jesus 
shout Jesus from the mountains. Oh, Jesus. Oh, and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Shout Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus. Oh, Jesus in the darkness. Over every enemy, shout Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, your name, your name is power. Your name is your name is alive. Shadows, down through the shadows, burn like a fire. Jesus for my family, Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus for my family. Yes, hallelujah. Jesus for my country. Hallelujah. Jesus for the world. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my country. Oh, Jesus for the world. Yay. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 yes, oh, no foe can stand against your name, hallelujah. Oh, I am a rebel yoyaka. Laramoe Romaia da Cavassi. Ira no 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 ia sala da baloa. Oh arraba va ve, no 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 ro va so chiara da va. Rebede o dor doma ti esa. Ora va pa vele dosta. Le va pa re me dosta. Le fra ve da ni bili o o do ai. La va botona mai. Oh, 
Father, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray in the Spirit. Let's just pray in the Spirit. 
I told you that I'm releasing something new. I have laid the foundation. I've molded you, I've corrected you, I've guided you. I've shifted you in your walk. I've poured into you to bring you to this place. But I'm telling you today is pivotal. What I'm doing in this place today is pivotal and when you pivot, you turn and you change direction. Because through the foundation, through the molding, through the correcting, through the building up, I've prepared you now so that I can pivot and show you off. Because I desire to pour more into you than you have ever imagined. Because it's time. Because it's time. I've told you, say no longer four months and then come the harvest. The harvest is now. We've always equated. You have always equated the harvest with the lost coming in. But I'm talking your harvest. And that harvest will bring in my harvest. You watch what I do. This is a pivotal weekend. This is a pivotal day. You will look back and say, it changed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a God. Glory be to God. Turn around and tell somebody, I'm never going to be the same. Now tell them, you're never going to be the same. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. My, my, my goodness. Hallelujah. Very quickly, we're going to receive our normal Sunday tithe and offering. And the good thing is, is our normal tithe and offering is more than enough. So if you need an offering envelope real quick, get your hand up, get your offering ready. We'll be receiving a love offering at the end of the service. And I love to be able to say this. I love to be able to call it a love offering when it really is. Because of how much we love Brother John. He has been such a blessing to Elizabeth in my life for so many years. Totally changed us. Amazing. I, I can't tell you, I was praying this morning, thanking God for the relationship that we have. It is such a blessing into my life. Thank you, Father. I do want to mention to you, during the month of April, we take up our our memorial offering for uh, Ron Callahan Ministries. And this year, the Lord laid it on our heart to dig a well in Africa. And we do that through Heidi's ministry, Iris Ministries. And our goal was to have $7,500 because that's what it takes to dig a well. And uh, see how our God does things? We brought in $12,000. Always. See, we got to get out of that just enough mentality. God, if we could just get $7,500, that'd be awesome. God doesn't do anything just enough. 
We've made him the just enough God. He says, I'll do exceeding abundantly. I can think big. You know, there's wealth out there most of the church doesn't even know exists. Ushers come. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to operate in your kingdom and in your system financially. And so this morning, we bring the tithe that belongs to you. We return it to you. We thank you that you open the windows of heaven to pour out blessing. And we bring our seed and we plant it in good ground. And we command the harvest back. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the time for the harvest this is the time for the favor of the lord this is the time to rise up this is the time of the rain this is the time this is the time this is the time, this is the time, this is the time, this is the time for the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. I know normally at this time we do the dollar box offering. You want to sow into the dollar box, do it sometime. But I'm not going to take any more time. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the dollar box is just a little box up here. And everything that comes in, we use to bless other churches. If we find a pastor in need, a church in need, we're able to. It's been amazing what we've been able to do. God is so, so faithful. Now I'm going to ask you if you want the lights on again. There's some beautiful people you need to see. It, It has been such an honor. Um, this entire weekend, um, I honestly, I don't take this lightly because God preordained this. His timing is perfect. And so we have been so honored. And so before Brother John comes, we've had the honor this time to have Pastor Jason Avanzini. I love how the British series says your last name. I'm trying to remember how he said it. Avanzi, Avanzi. That's how the British version of Siri says your name. And so I'm, I've, we've been, we've loved getting to know Pastor Jason uh, over the past couple of days. And I told him Saturday, I said, "You're family now." And so he's going to come back and minister here in June. And so I've asked. That's good because if you booed, I was going to cancel him. So I've asked Pastor Jason to come and. And just to share for a few moments. Thank you, Simon. Wow, praise God. Thank you for not booing. That was, <laughs> your faith is very strong. Um, Pastor, what you just shared a moment ago really uh, paralleled with exactly what the Lord put on my heart last night during the service. And that has to do with our foundations and Proof of this was during the service, I gave a scripture to uh, Pastor Eric or Reverend Eric, and we have it now. It's Ezra chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, and this is in the New King James Version. I'll read it for you, okay? It says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asphah, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord. Because because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It's one thing to celebrate... (laughs) get in the new sound system, getting, sitting next to somebody or having the nice chairs. But they were celebrating just the foundation. And this is what I really felt in my, in my spirit, is that right now a foundation has been laid. 
both for this church, this body and this group, but also for every individual. That the past years have been a struggle. There's been moments where there's crying, sleepless nights, different struggles that we've been through. But I know what the Word of God says. It says that God can work all things together for the good of those that love God and are called according to His purpose. A foundation has been laid for your victory in Jesus' name. Healings are going to be taking place at an even grander scale. An explosion of people coming to this church. Revival sweeping this church. Restoration of relationships coming. Some of you are just staring at me. You say, Jason, you're just trying to get our hopes up. I know what you're doing. Well, you should get your hopes up. Do you know what faith is? It's the substance of things hoped for. If your hope is low... Your faith has got to be on empty. If your faith is, if your faith is up then, and your hope is up, you've got, faith has got something to work with. Yeah. A foundation has been laid for your victory, individually and corporately. I feel that in my spirit with everything in me, that God has a plan for us to prosper us and not to harm us. And I even feel, I, mean, I'm, I feel the Holy Spirit here in such a, a profound way that I have not experienced in some time. It's a very tangible experience here. And I believe it does hinge on what's going to take place today and what has taken place throughout this weekend. So get your hopes way up because everything is, is changing and it's time to celebrate now. Don't wait until things have already happened. The foundation has already been laid. That takes the longest. Once that foundation is laid, things start moving. Are we still here? Yes. Go one more or no? Well, I'm going to come back in June, so I'm not going <laughs> to... But I, yeah, I can't say everything. No, but this is a, a... When it comes to building, we serve a God of order. He builds that foundation, and then he'll build on top of that. And Christ is our foundation. Amen? Another thing that we see that starts slow and then accelerates is whenever things are laid out. We see a scripture in Ecclesiastes, it's strange, when you just look at it by itself. It says, where a tree falls, wherever it falls, there it will lie. You think, wow, praise God. That's going to be our verse for the year. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's one thing, but once you begin to understand about how to cut down a tree, you begin to see the importance of what that scripture is saying. Because when a tree falls, <laughs> it's not going to move. And once it starts falling... You can't hardly get it to change direction. And I've helped cut down trees there in Texas before, little trees, not big trees. But when you're cutting down a tree, you have to know where to put notches in it so that it'll start moving in the direction you want it to go. So it doesn't fall on a house or block the road, but so that it'll move in a certain direction. Now, the greatest, I wouldn't even call it a notch, the greatest decision that you've ever made with your life is to follow Christ and become a new creation in him. But now we have this opportunity to put these notches into the tree of our life to see us move in the direction of the fullness of the potential that God has for us. A lot of us have a picture of how we want our lives to lay out, but we, we don't consider all the notches that get it moving that direction. And one of the most powerful notches that we have in our life has to do with our finances. It has to do with our finances. It has to do with our faith. It has to do with us reaching for more because God makes it available. Why wouldn't we pray to see the dead raised? It's made available to us. Why wouldn't we believe that God could give us more than we could ask or think? It's made available to us. Why wouldn't we believe that God could heal us? It's made available to us. Every time we see Christ moving in the earth, every time we see him moving, we know that when we see Christ, we're seeing the Father. So Jesus is perfect theology. Amen? Jesus is there preaching to the 5,000, everyone's hungry. Jesus doesn't say, hey, at least you're here. At least you're hearing me speak. Who cares if you're hungry? No, he says, let's feed them. Because our God cares about us. He doesn't just care that we're here and that we've got the message and that we're going to heaven one day. What he wants is for heaven to come down and be through us. Woo! Okay. Okay. Praise God. A foundation has been laid. Amen? Amen? Would you stand and please help me welcome my grandfather? Would you like to? 
Well, he did it. Come on, sir. Before you're seated, before you're seated, tell that person near to you that Brother John thinks they look real nice. Would you do that for me, please? <laughs> Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, 10, 10 years, Brother Jason has tracked me. He has hung onto my coattail, peeked at my notes, copies everything, and he now is preaching a powerful word. He's going to be back Wednesday, and uh, I feel he's going to be back many times. That's yeah, some tremendous yeah. move. A lot of young people need to hear, Brother Jason. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to thank you for the service last night. My spirit really was blessed. My spirit was blessed that I could say some things to you about the personal, the, how personal our relationship is with each other and how it is to be in the future. I was uh, setting my directions and limiting, way limiting, limiting, limiting the amount of places I was gonna be going. But I got a real clear word that I'm to be here. Amen. And um, to, I'm gonna have you and your wife down. Now, Patricia's not there anymore, but we're gonna have you down, spend some time studying at the house and get to where we really know each other better. Amen. Amen. Let them know it's not all. <laughs> Just, <laughs> got a little nervous there, sir. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm moving to a bigger house, but not that big. <laughs> My wife, she really moved on to a bigger house. Yeah. I don't know whether you heard or not, but in uh, July of last year, she left me for another man. <laughs> she went with Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I want to speak to you today about just some, just some, a little bit of correction on biblical economics, some things that, uh, you know, uh, there's enemies out there against this message. There are people literally that are almost turn on their heels and walk away if you start trying to tell them that God wants to bless them. I don't understand that. I, uh, you know, they, 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 they look, I guess, to the devil to bless them whenever they, when they're in his program, but you get in God's program, they want a God that doesn't uh, bless. But... I want to bring a scripture to you. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, 3 John, the first couple of verses. 3 John, first couple of verses. Very familiar. But just give you a little background on this verse of scripture. Uh, Jim Baker, very powerful man of God, had some problems in his life. Uh, uh, somebody said, well, we need to pray for Jim Baker. I, I said at that time, I said, well, if you'd been praying for him right along, we wouldn't probably need to pray for him now. <laughs> we'll wait till they're off the cliff before we pray for them. But anyway, uh, when Jim came out of, uh, out of prison, a group went to him because he was very strong in the prosperity message, the fact that God wanted to bless his children. And they came with this verse where it says, Beloved, I wish, that second verse... Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. And they came to Jim and he was in a very vulnerable position. He was just out of a very unique problem. Uh, being in jail must be a traumatic, like uh, near-death experience just to be there. And he comes out and this group meets him and they bring him the news say, Jim, you don't want to be preaching prosperity anymore. It's wrong. There's things in the Bible that, is, that have been misquoted. And this is one of the verses they picked because that verse that says, above all things that thou mayest prosper, that word is, uh, 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 excuse me, it's word number 2137 <laughs> in the Strong's Concordance. And it has, a, it has two definitions that come in the word. You can go to Strong's and you'll find them there. It, one of them is to grant a prosperous and expeditious journey, to be led by an easy way, to go by an easy way in an easy direction. Now, that's all of the definition they gave, Jim, and told him, said, Jim, that you've used that verse so many times. God wants you to prosper and be in health. Even as your soul prospers, it's talking about a journey. 
It's talking about a journey. It's not talking about finances in your pocket. Well, it, I think, sidelined him and put him in a whole, whole different direction than what he probably would be going today. With all respect to what he does now, he's, he's far from where he was about bringing the message of abundance and God's desire to bless into people's lives. But when you look at this verse, that word prosper there, the second meaning is to grant, uh, the second meaning is to prosper and be successful and to prosper in all ways. But watch with me, please. The Apostle John speaks to the beloved elder named Gaius. And my understanding is Gaius is, a, is one of the elders in the Corinthian church. And this letter comes to him. And as the letter comes, it's talking about, not about him having a prosperous journey, because in a minute you're going to find out that Gaius isn't going anywhere. He's not going on a journey. But that definition being brought up by these folks, it came against the things of God uh, in relation to prosperity. And I find so many places, I find people uh, getting a hold of me, well, what about this verse, Brother John? What about that verse, Brother John, that, that speaks like God doesn't want you to have anything? Well, you know what? Why, why would God not want you to have anything? Why would he say that he, uh, he became poor that you might be rich? Well, was that just some kind of little saying that he had? He became poor on that cross of Calvary. He became the, when they crowned him with that crown of thorns, you know where those thorns came from? They first popped up when poverty showed up on the planet. And then now how they crowned him the king of poverty. He became poor that you might be rich. You, you, you pick up the, so with this though, we find that, and, I, and I, I want to work through this with you, that you have an answer because someone will somewhere bring it to you because it's a headline with the crowd that's against what we teach. But moving a little bit further, when he says, thou mayest prosper be in health, uh, let me interject that it does speak of that. That verse is used that way. In Romans 1 and 10, the apostle Paul in his earliest days, he says, I want to make a journey to Rome. And when he uses that verse, he says, I want it to be a prosperous journey when I go, uh, even in Romans uh, 10 and 1, it says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, uh, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might, be pros I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come. So it is used sometimes for a journey. But you come now to this point and all of a sudden you find that Gaius is not going on a journey, but there's travelers in this chapter. This chapter is about some travelers, and it's talking about taking care of the travelers when they come through the church and taking care of them in a proper way. So he's praying that he might prosper and be in health, that they might be able to take care of these that are traveling through the church. And we see that looking just a little bit further. Uh, you get into uh, Third John and five, uh, five through eight. The Common English Bible says, "Dear friend, you, you you act faithful in whatever you do for your brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers." He says, "You got strangers coming through your church, and the report, like you see in the next verse, uh, they spoke that six verse. They spoke highly of your love in front of the church, and all you would do well provide, and, and all would." do well to provide for, the, for their journey in a way that honors God. You, you, are you picking up what's saying? This is a church that caters to missionaries. This is a church that missionaries come through. And in a minute, you're going to find out they're going to be depleted. They're, they're without a donor base, these that are coming. And so whenever you hear this thing about prospering, it's not just for the nice automobile. It's not just for the... <clears throat> A nice house, and there's nothing wrong with a nice house. There's some things wrong with a not so nice house. Nothing wrong. There's some things wrong with a not so nice car, but there's nothing wrong with a nice car. But this is this is just secondary, because as he speaks here, he's speaking this prosperity into this man's life, so that as the servants of God come through the house, that they can be treated like royalty as they move in and out of that church. Are, are, are you getting a little more idea what it is? But, but now, just the way a verse is interpreted has taken one of the 
great powers that we had in the gospel in our nation and totally flipped his mind around in a whole other direction. So you have to be careful because they're playing for keeps. They're playing for keeps. And really, if you want a parallel, they're the liberals of the Christian movement is who they are. They're the ones that want to take and deplete every one of the truths, the raising of the dead, the healing power. And sister, I felt the power of God last night as you prayed for me. Recovered from, from a kidney disease and then comes and laid hands on me and said, my healing is transferring into you. Honey, I received that right there. I, I touched my spirit. Another brother touched me last night. I'm holding one of his hands here and he's got his hand on my back and I mean, it's hot. You got off the back road, didn't you? Well, you, you got off that back road, didn't you? Okay, he's right up here in front with me now. Yeah, but I felt that heat right there. But let me tell you, I've been prayed for and, and poked at and uh, hugged and uh, uh, talked over, but I have felt the power of, the healing power of God here. But then there's something unique about you too is whenever I'm here, I'm talking to a people that have to do with here, but you are all over the world. You have connections everywhere. You are connected to ministry after ministry. Amen. And it's this that I'm talking to you about now, the prosperity, yes, want you to have a nice house, all those things, but you're in a place that it's not gonna, that's not gonna dilute. The word's gonna be out stronger than ever. The bigger you get, the stronger it's gonna go out that there's a place that cares about the missionary, cares about the regions beyond, and you're gonna have to have money to get that done. I've, I've, I, I, for many years as a, as a Baptist preacher, we had a great burden for missions, always did have with, and, uh, but there was always that, well, we could give this up and then we could give a little bit more and then we could do without this and we could do a little bit more. And you know, God was always faithful. I'd say, well, I could do without hot lunch at, at lunch. I'd sack my lunch and I could have this more money for my faith promise. And man, there the money was. But you see, whenever I got the understanding biblical economics, I didn't strange change my giving. I changed what I was believing for. Yes. Yes. Before I was believing I could get along without it. And then now I'm believing, well, it will be exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think. Amen. And whatever good thing I cause to happen for anybody else, God will cause that same thing to happen for me. So one of the first steps I made towards having a new car is I said, church, we're gonna start giving new cars once a year. Some missionary is gonna get a new car from us and about the third time, then all of a sudden I was in a new car. You see, whatever good thing you cause to happen for anybody else, God will cause that thing to happen for you. Yeah. First time you get a chance, look at uh, uh, Genesis, the 20th chapter, the last verse or two. We won't look at it right now. But this is when uh, Abimelech, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, Abraham prays for Abimelech's and the wombs open in, Abraham's house, in, in Abimelech's house, the next verse, God opens Sarah's womb and Sarah conceives. That's 25 years he's wanting that woman to get pregnant. Yeah. And as soon as he did it for someone else that he spoke that breaking of that opening of the wombs in that house, the wombs opened in his house that night. Amen. You follow whatever good thing you cause to happen for anybody else, God will cause that very exact same thing to happen to you. So what I'm teaching you now is not so much that, that uh, you get this little lesson of what happened to Jim Baker, but something has to happen. There has to be money in your hands for the next things that are coming up, yes. it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be impossible for the things that God is saying to get ready to happen for Him not to also bring forth abundant increase into your lives. Amen. And then that eighth verse of where I was a moment ago, it says, "Therefore we ought to help people like this so that we can be co-workers with them." So, as we continue to look at just a little bit further. Uh, the financial expenses of the church that Gaius was an elder of, let's go over them again and take a, take a quick look at them. I'm gonna look at them in several different translations so that you can really catch fifth, sixth, seventh verse, what's being said. In the Message Bible, that fifth verse says, Dear friend, when you extend hospitality to Christian brothers and sisters, even when they're strangers, you make the faith visible. The faith becomes visible. Did you know, you know faith is visible. Did you know that? Faith is visible. I've had people say, well, faith is invisible, not invisible at all. When, when you look into the scriptures, James says, show me your faith, the second chapter, the 18th verse, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen. 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 
are, are you seeing what I'm saying? God says, look, when you treat these people coming in, when you treat them right, when you see to it that their needs are met, when you see that, they, that they're treated in a proper fashion, God sees to it that things happen in your life in a proper fashion. But, I, you know, I, I remember in, in, uh, in years past, I'd go to mission conferences as a Baptist. With all respect to the Baptists, I thank God there wasn't any Pentecostals looking for me when I was lost. It was Baptists looking for me. <laughs> and uh, they won me to Christ, and I thank God for them. But I remember going to the, to the mission conferences, and all, the, all the, uh, the missionaries would be sleeping in one of the bigger classrooms. They'd have beds in there. They'd all be sleeping in these in, on ground, and then they'd all be eating at the church. And uh, uh, when it was all done, the budget was raised, and there was a few dollars for everybody, and you left with some little money in your hand. But it didn't. Re those missionaries had to go for almost two years of traveling from church to church to church until finally they had enough money. Somebody put them on for ten dollars a month here, twenty dollars a month, twenty-five over there, and finally they'd get to the field. And then four years later, they'd be back again. They'd be needing all kind of things. And another two years taken out. It has to be money in your hands, yes. in your hands, so the money can be put in their hands so that the regions beyond can hear the message of Jesus Christ. Are you, are you grasping what I'm saying? And I read just a little further to you. Uh, Third John, the sixth verse, uh, Bible in basic English, and I've picked some of these that are a little easier to grasp. These, speaking of the missionaries, have given witness to the church of your love for them, and will do well, to, and you will do well to send them on their way, well cared for, as is right for servants. There's just going to have to be for where you're going, and 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 I don't know how else to say it. And I'm repeating myself again and again, but you're going to find that the bigger the crowd gets, it's not going to get more money. It's not going to be more surplus, because the more people you have, the more it costs the more it costs. And then you're going to find another phenomenon. Here's something else. Why, why am I saying this now? You're going to find that while you're here today, uh, your family, I think the two of you, and then you had two children with you. Was there two to three? That's five seats. But when you build again, y'all probably going to have to seat about 15 seats. Won't need but five, but you're going to need to see about about 15 seats if you're going to build a bigger building. You follow what I'm saying, Pastor? And some of you that's sitting in two seats, well, you're going to maybe, you need to see about six in the new building. And then whatever square footage you're using, you're going to need about five times that much more square footage. Amen. And how are you going to do that? Because right now, we, we sometimes, we, how long did we work for? We got enough to get these nice chairs in here. Because I think back in my time, there was a time the chairs weren't quite this nice in here one time. But too much time passed. Too much time passed. You guys are going to be in a, you're going to be moving fast. Yes. Yes. And it's going to take exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. And where's it going to come from? The government's not going to work anything out for you. Now, if you'll quit, if you'll quit working, they'll probably do something for you. <laughs> but, but if you're a worker and you're planning to have abundance, exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think, you're going to have to be a worker. But you have to know that these plans that you're making right now, they're, they're, Grand and they're exciting, but they're real. I don't need, I got five kids and my wife and I, five, uh, six, seven, uh, we need seven chairs. No, 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 I need 21 chairs I'll have to buy when I come in the building. Are you picking up what I'm saying? And the air conditioning is going to have to be, my goodness, you know, every person comes in is a heater. I mean, we're literally stacking heaters in these buildings and then trying to cool them. 96 point something degrees of temperature. Each one of them brings in the door. They come in, a little, little, little oven comes in and sits down. <laughs> and then you're just cooking the electricity out the door about there trying to cool it and then say, well, let's get some more in here. Let's, let's, let's have a big campaign and let's win another thousand to the Lord. And here comes a thousand more heaters walking in. <laughs> it, it, you see, the whole thing, the economics of the whole thing over the years that we've built churches, the economics of the whole thing is so different than anybody thinks it is. But what has to happen is you simply have to prosper. Well, does God want the church to grow? Yes, he wants it to grow. And if he wants it to grow, then it just stands to reason that he wants you to prosper. I want to, let me quickly deal with another little item here. I had a note that I made. 
I was going to deal with something with you about. Uh, yeah. Let me get that in hand. Forgive me. Are you okay? Yes. I wrote it on the back. Here it is. Uh, look with me. Uh, put uh, uh, Mark the fourth chapter up on up on the up on the screen, please. And when he talked there, and uh, he said, uh, "Beloved, I wish above all things that I may prosper in health, even as thy soul prospers." I want to deal about your soul, about your soul. When you talk about what is your soul, and my goodness, you can get into books that have been written trying people trying to tell what the soul is, but your soul simply is your understanding. You are what you understand. I have a little baby uh, we ate with the other day. One of our friends just has a newborn baby. And that little baby is just like this, just going like this all the time. And it's just, it's just trying to understand what it's seeing. That computer is just trying, it's loading up, loading up, loading up. And whatever that little one understands, that's what that little one's going to be. And uh, when, I, when, you, when, you, when you get into this thing about the understanding... Um, for instance, let me, let, me, let me give you an illustration. It has to do with seed time and harvest. I brought this to you before. I'll bring it again. Uh, if, if you were to be, uh, any two of you, say that, say that, let me pick here. Say the two of you, are you, far, are you farmers? No. Okay, say you just put on a farm, okay? okay? You had a big piece of acreage. You had everything that you needed to farm, identical to a guy next to you on a farm. And that guy over there has been farming for 50 years. This is your first year to farm. You're born again. He's a libertine. He's a, he's a foul character, ugly guy. But he's been farming 50 years. Now the first year, who's going to have the biggest harvest? You're praying over your seed. You're doing all kinds of things. Who's going to have the biggest harvest? What? You know why. He understands it. He understands it. You see, and that's why some of you will sow something and you're thinking, no, it didn't work for me. No, it may have worked. It might not. See, you might not have had a bigger crop because you didn't understand enough about it. Yeah. Didn't understand yeah. enough about it. See, but, and let's get now a uh, verses, and, and Jay, help me get right on that one, would you? Uh, is it 23rd? Uh, therefore, uh, would he, uh, let's go on to 21st, uh, the 21st verse. Now, he has just talked about, he's just talked about the uh, uh, word has been given, it has been revealed that it has harvest power. He said, explained harvest power, but then he says something here. And he said unto them as a candle brought to be put under a bushel. Now what is going on here? What a candle to be put under a bushel or under a bed put a, or uh, not to be set on a candlestick? Well, the Bible says the candle is the spirit of the Lord. The candle is your spirit inside of you, searching out things, trying to figure out how things are going. So God says, now, if you're going to put this seed time and harvest to work, you're going to have to take and you're going to have to come into understanding. Your understanding is going to have to increase. You can't have your understanding hid under somebody's doctrine or under this, that, or the other. You're going to have to put it on the candlestick and then God's going to have to start showing you how to get this thing done. Yeah. Are, are you picking that up? Now watch it a little bit more with me. It says, uh, for there's nothing hid which shall not be manifest. I think that's 22nd verse. Now, if any man have ears to hear, now this, this is something, I've taught this here before, people never pick it up. It, the next time I bring it up to people that don't understand what I said to them, it says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That word hear is your Greek word number 191. It means to understand. It doesn't mean hear a sound. It means understand what you heard. When I was a little boy, my mother would say, Johnny, it's time to come in. And then she come back out and she said, did you hear me? She wasn't asking whether I under, he heard her. She knew I heard her. She said, do you understand where, you, where you're headed, son? <laughs> I want you in the house. I want you in the house. Okay, so now watch now. This thing, it, it moves along here. And he said unto them, take heed what you 
understand. See the word here? Now with what measure you meet. Now watch how people go off. Well, with you know, if you give with a teaspoon, you get with a teaspoon. If you give with a shovel, God will give you with a shovel. It's not what it's saying. Go back one. It's an implied subject. If any man have ears to understand, let him understand. Next verse. And he said unto them, take heed what you understand. With what measure of understanding you meet, it shall be measured unto you. And to you that understand shall more be given. Up one. For he that hath understanding to him shall be given and to he that hath not understanding from him shall be taken even that which he has. Now, you try to interpret that any other way. Get, your, get to these guys, these, uh, uh, what are they called? Commentators. commentators. <laughs> you ever wonder, well, how would you ever want to read after a commentator? Yeah, really. <laughs> commentator. Yeah. But anyway, they all just go everywhere with this thing. But it's just simply an implied subject. And if you're going to prosper in the seed time and harvest operations of God, you're going to have to understand how he thinks, how he feels about things, how he reacts to things. You're going to have to know that he is not a man and he doesn't operate like a man. He doesn't think like a man. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. Uh, and you have to know how to deal with mysteries. Mysteries. And one of the mysteries is the fact that when you plant that seed, there comes a point that it is absolutely, totally up to God that it comes up. But once it comes up, then understanding will change the yield. The yield can be changed by understanding. See, the more you're down at the, at the agent, the, the farm agent, and the more you're picking up leaflets and reading them, and the more you're reading the back of different things that comes to you, cans of different things, and you're finding out more, your yield will start going up. But then there'll come a point when you understand enough about it not to be blocking out the leaf, to harm the, the harvest, then God will get under that thing, and all of a sudden, no matter how wise he is, not be able to outdo you because Amen. I have a friend, uh, Dale Kitchens. Dale Kitchens is the largest uh, cotton farmer in the world. And uh, he's got five big tractors that run. They just run off the GPS all day long, just plowing ground, sections and sections. And uh, I remember I remember when, when I, uh, one time I talked to him, I said, what, how was the crop? He said, oh, it was terrible. I said, didn't, didn't do good, didn't do good at all said, uh, oh, well, I had a little, some, some come up here and a little over there, and I had, uh, what do they call it, the bow weevils. And he said, I was, well, actually, anyway, I was the only one that got to the, got to the, got to the gin. Nobody else even got, got to the gin. I said, well, Dale, you got to the gin? Did you have labor costs? I met my labor costs. Well, did you have fertilizer? No, I met for everything costs. I just broke even. Mm. I said, well, Son, you had hundredfold. He said, what? Here's what hundredfold is. It's optimum yield under the circumstances. Everybody else lost all of their money for their seed. They, they didn't get the, the labor wasn't paid, had equipment repossessed. And then the next year he called me up and said, guess what, Brother John? I'm the only one who had any seed. <laughs> I mean, what, what they took, when they, when they cleaned up my, my, my cotton, I had the seed. I just said, hang on to the seed. I'll use it next year. So you follow what I'm saying? So when, when you start doing this, you have to understand, too, that you're under certain circumstances. And, uh, and sometimes you, you know what a circumstance is? It's a circle you're standing in. <laughs> and sometimes you just have to step out of that circle. Sometimes it's a circle of your friends. Somebody listening, listen, you listen good. Some of you will never get anywhere unless you break out of some of those friends and start locking in on some people that are in God's house and understanding yeah. better, understanding better what the flow is in God's house yeah. rather than just showing up on Sunday and kind of falling in the stream, you know. 
I hope you're picking up some of what I'm trying to say to you. Then I got just one other area that I want to go with you. And I'm sorry, but I tell you what, last night, if you weren't here last night, did, is, there, is, there, is there recordings of last night? Yes. You better get recordings of last night because yes. last night, I'm telling you the truth, my notes became obsolete. Most of them are just so much paper. <laughs> Jay, yes, sir. I want to get into that thing on, uh, now Jay knows the word. You guys are going to see that when Jay comes. I want to get into that, uh, where, uh, help me with that one where, uh, uh, according to your words. Um, the, uh, the account? Account, yeah. Philippians something, isn't it? Yeah, Philippians 4.17. Philippians 4.17, put it up there. I'm sorry, but I, I came with certain notes, but you changed the tenure of the meeting, everything, the... The ground moved under me a little bit. <clears throat> Paul says when he's talking about they brought, they brought finances to him and he's speaking an increase in their life. He says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Do you see that word on the end there, account? Yes, that is the word logos. It, it, they, they were afraid to translate it. They, it. It scared them. They didn't know how in the world that fruit would abound to your words. But we're the people that speak a thing and it comes to pass. Amen. And, 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 and I, I, my whole, you know, I, I, my whole vocabulary, I continuously am having to rack it all up and look at it and make sure is this the vocabulary of a man that's got to have his kidneys healed? Amen. Is this the vocabulary of a man that has to travel many long distances in airplanes and now is getting older? I have to keep changing because I, I was moaning about travel to you <laughs> I disciplined myself about it in the room. I said, you're going to be traveling your whole life, so you may as well just shut up about not wanting to travel. <laughs> but you've got to speak the right things. Yes. You can't speak insufficiency and shortage. Right. Amen. And, and, and please, when you said that about being out of debt, I'm believing you're going to be many of you out of debt. I'd like yes. for all of you to be out of debt. Yes. But... Let me, let me say this to you now. I'm just caution you in another area, okay? You can't go to seed on getting out of debt. You can go mathematically to try to get out of debt and go to seed on it, and then you're trying to have something mathematical happen, and then there's not going to be enough to do some of the other things that need to be done. You need miracle yes. debt cancellation. Yes. You need to be praying, sowing with it, praying with it, seeing that you're getting bills paid, seeing that you're not. One of the big things about getting out of debt is not get any more debt. But then, are you figuring what I'm saying? Because you can go to seat on this thing and all of a sudden you're not even having money to put in the offering plate. Yep. You're throwing everything into your bills, trying to get rid of your, mathematically your bills. It, it, it's not a mathematical thing you're trying to do. It's a miracle thing. Yes. Miracle. And my son David, you know David's been in this church here. I've told this story here before. David bought a new truck one time, a new Ford truck. Ford, Ford, no GMC. He bought a GMC truck and he, uh, uh, he kept waiting for the payments to come. The payment slip. So he called them one day and said, I hadn't got my payment book. And they said, son, we, we don't have any record here needing to send you a payment book. He said, no, I just bought a truck from you. So he just kept fooling with them. And finally a voice came on and said, son, if I was you, I'd just shut up and go on and enjoy the truck. <laughs> said, now, how many of you know the bank makes mistakes sometimes about that you'll look at your bank and say, whoa, wait a minute. This is not right. There's... $500 missing. They make those mistakes all the time. Can't you yeah. be, start believing they'll make some mistakes in the other direction? All of a sudden, there's more than enough in your... I mean, what, you, you follow miracles, work through computers. I mean, God can just move through a computer and just change everything. Yeah. People, I'm, I know fellas that was up for parole and there was no way in the world they'd get out through parole and then all of a sudden, there's no record of anything. The computer has just lost it. You don't have a word about you. And out the door they go. I hope you're picking up on what I'm trying to say to you. And I, and I just got to tell you, I'm, I'm not just full of information today. I'm just full of wonder about you and being a part of what this is here. Amen. Jay, you got anything else to say? Get up here and touch. Get up here and preach a little bit. Is that okay, preacher? Get up here. Praise God. Well, he left his notes. Yeah. Woo! 
Well, this, this is great. In fact, could we back up on um, the Philippians uh, chapter 4? Let's go to, let's look at 15 maybe. I want to show the picture here is Paul is talking specifically about an offering. He said, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now, this point was brought out last night that he didn't, Paul didn't say, well, you're the only church that gave, because there were other churches that were giving. But he said, this is the only church, the Philippian church, that has communicated with me in giving and receiving. So he's already putting right in there that there's something coming back, that that expectation is there, giving and receiving, but you only. And please know this too, whenever you talk to, to other people, to even other Christians, Sometimes they'll look at you sideways when you're talking about having a financial breakthrough or getting out of debt and all of these things. They'll say, well, I don't know about that. Well, only one church communicated with Paul with giving and receiving. There was many churches that gave. Praise God for the friends that are giving. and They don't have that next bit of grace, that next bit of divine understanding that's saying, hey, there's something to receive back from here. And this is also powerful. This was what... You brought up, you said a lot of great things. One thing that you just said was about doing without so that they could give in an offering. And whenever, of course, I've come in, whenever I was born, there was already an understanding of seed time and harvest. But as long as the understanding was, what can I cut back on so I can make sure I give, there was only enough. But as soon as the understanding was, I'm not (laughs) giving this away and never going to see it again, It's not goodbye, it's I'll see you later in another form, in a greater dimension. It's going to come back. It's amazing that God uses seed, time, and harvest to be the picture of what he wants to do when it comes to us giving and receiving. He doesn't use use a mushroom as an example, something that just comes up overnight and can be knocked over. No, he talks about trees and he talks about corn that has an amazing amount of of fruit that comes from it. One corn of seed, two ears, maybe 750 or so on either. You got 1,500 kernels of corn that come from that one seed. I should have brought my seeds today. I got seeds at the hotel. But what's interesting is many people have a picture of food or they have a picture of a product, but they don't have the actual product. And this is what happens even when we get with seeds. You have a seed and you'll show people, what is this? They'll say, it's corn, it's a tomato. Say, no, it's not, it's just a picture of corn and a picture of a tomato. Then you say, how do we actually get to the corn? How do we get to the potato or the tomato? By sowing the seed. I'm getting off track too now, it's up here. Holy Spirit's catchy. (laughs) Okay, and then let's go to the next one. But ye only, for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because, now he's saying all this, look at this. Not because I desire a gift from you, but I desire fruit that would abound to your logos. Is that word? To your words. Some of us have been speaking to our problems. We've been speaking to our seed. Grow, grow. But we're not planning it. If we're not planning it, there's no power in those words. Or let me say it this way. There's a greater dimension of power that comes whenever we align our words with the Word of God and the principles of God. Not just the, but the principles are as the sowing of the seed. Amen? I got a whole other message if we're going to do it. <laughs> Praise God. Um, giving and receiving, this is... You want me to keep going? Faster? <laughs> okay, okay. I'll give you I'll give you a little bit more, right? Praise God. There is some, it's Holy Spirit is in this place. Amen. Amen. All right, maybe I'll share about this in June, but I'll give you a little bit of a picture, a little snapshot. One of the 
first congregational offerings that we see in Scripture is the offering that Moses directs towards the tabernacle. He says, look, everyone, God has instructed us. We're going to get together. We're going to build the tabernacle. This is an exodus when they're out there in the wilderness. Now, all of these people happen to have money, happen to have gold. Now, where did all that come from? It came from the Egyptians. So God has already given them all of this wealth, but he's given it to them for a purpose. It wasn't, here, just enjoy this so you can have, so you can have more nice, shiny things when you're walking around in the desert. No. He gave it to them for a specific purpose. Now, the purpose, we'll notice here, it gets, the enemy is always up to something. The enemy tries to pervert that purpose through Aaron. And he says, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an offering with, with the golden calf. We know the story. They create a golden calf. And we're going to cry out and worship God because we have this golden calf. And what's interesting about that is that Aaron literally says tomorrow, after they build the golden calves, Aaron says tomorrow we will have a feast unto Jehovah. He doesn't say unto Baal. So here he is. He's done this amazing offering. He's thinking he's doing the right thing, and we're going to give God all the glory for it. And God was not happy with it at all. God was nowhere in that moment. But now let me fast forward just past that to where we see two chapters later, Moses says, God has directed us in this offering. Now they begin to give, and it wasn't just, it wasn't everyone. I'm going into it. All right, with Aaron's offering, it was not an offering, it was a fundraiser for some golden calves. Now with Aaron's fundraiser, he says, let's all give something. We can all give gold out of our, we'll all give our earrings, and we can all have, give an equal sacrifice, and it would be wonderful, right? There'll be enough. Well, that is not at all what God desires. Equal sacrifice is, is a little strange to think about whenever we're talking about sowing. Now, I know that our offering is a, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. It's a sacrifice that's pleasing to the Lord. But it's not goodbye. Once again, it's, I'll see you later. So, any, okay, here we go. Moses has the offering puts this together, and he says, we're not going to have everyone involved. He says, for this offering, we're only going to have those that have a willing heart. This is Exodus 35. You can look later. Okay, be like the Bereans and check this out. Make sure what I'm saying is in the Bible. It says, only those of a willing heart. And I looked up these words. What does willing heart mean? Heart had to do with understanding. And, and willing had to do with generosity. So he's saying, look, not everyone here has an understanding about generosity or an understanding about giving and receiving, but only those who have an understanding I want you to participate. They begin to come. They begin to come. Today, it says they brought willing offerings unto the Lord. To the point that Moses has to stand up and say, stop the giving. (laughs) There is more than enough. Are, are you need to get excited about the day that pastor stands up and says, we have more than enough. The day is going to come. It's going to happen in your life too. Amen? Amen? At the end of this offering, because an offering, when it comes to the Lord, anytime we bring an offering to the Lord, he will always return something to us. He always has not... He doesn't have that subtraction in mind. He has an addition in mind for our lives. And where is the addition with the tabernacle? Well, right after the tabernacle was built, and this is in the chapter 40, I believe, of Exodus, it says that the Holy Spirit, that God himself comes into that tabernacle and rested like a cloud by day and a fire by night. So the whole idea, this whole offering wasn't about having a building project. It was about God getting closer to his people. And in that came a dramatic change. You really have to think about this. A group of people, could have been a million people. I've heard all kinds of numbers on how many Israelites were there at that moment. All of these people have a cloud over them during the day and a fire guiding them by night. So here they are in the heat of the day, and they're in the cool of the shade. Here they are, it's cold, it's at night, and they're being warmed by the fire. That is a picture of being in the world and not of the world. That is a picture of being light in the darkness. 
of being salt in the earth, of being a city on a hill. Why are we called a city on a hill? So that people traveling can see the light, they can see the, they can see the town, they can move to it and come to that same refuge, that same joy, that same experience that we have with God. So this is, this is what that offering was about, about God getting closer to his people. And please hear this. When God gets closer to his people, he will always manifest in you opposite to the struggle surrounding you. God will always operate in you and through you opposite to the struggle that is surrounding you. So in a world that is full of sickness and disease, we can walk in health and healing. And Jesus is a picture of that. Not only did he walk in health and healing, but he's healing people. He says, we're called to do these things. We're called to do the greater works, right? So it's time for us not only to walk in that health and healing, but to be, uh, to be ambassadors, to be those that are there channeling that energy. God, I just speak the Holy Spirit into this situation. Bring healing power into that. It's powerful. In a time where there's chaos and uncertainty, we can live in peace and harmony. We see this with Jesus also. He's asleep on the boat in the middle of a storm. That peace is in him. He gets up and releases that peace to everything that's going on around him. Come on. That's what we are called to be as believers. Not just people going through life and are waiting for a bus to take us to heaven, but we are those who are supposed to be operating in the world opposite to the struggle that is surrounding us. But how do we do it? Well, we've got, to, we've got to pay attention to seed time and harvest. Because anytime there's an offering, there's an opportunity for God to move a little bit closer into our lives. Jason, how can you say that? Well, Jesus said it. He said, wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. So here he is. He's saying, look, every time you have an offering, you have an opportunity to get a little bit closer to God, for him to get a little bit closer to you. A little bit closer to God, a little bit closer to you. Are you seeing this? Praise God, a little bit closer to you. That's what we all desire, isn't it? Amen. Amen. God is not trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something to you. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs> you pastor? Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Nothing like grandkids, is there? My goodness. Can I show you? Can I show one out of Philippians 4? Look at verse 16. Five times in chapter 4, Paul commends their giving. And it's a real quick verse. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again. And that phrase once and again in the King James can mean twice or multiple times. But the interesting thing is, it's a two-week journey to Thessalonica, and Paul was only there for one month. And Philippians were so set to get their offering into that ground, they made that trip at least twice, if not more times. See, and that's what Paul wrote when he said, you got a purpose in your heart to be a giver. And it's when we make that decision, our giving comes first. God says, I can trust you with more because you'll do what I tell you to do with it. Now, I'm going to, I hope it's okay to share. Uh, Brother John got in the car today and he said, Pastor, um, I don't need anything else. And uh, I said, well, that's too bad because we're going to give more. I honor you, I respect you, but this ain't none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> either we serve the God of more than enough or we don't so you do not want to miss an opportunity to put seed into this ground I, I'm telling you what it has changed my life the impact not just this weekend but the impact brother John has had in mine and Elizabeth's life has changed us and so we want to honor him I think one of my favorite stories that you've ever told, you were at Creflo's, and that spirit of giving hit. And you guys were standing down on the, the platform, and people came from all over 
just to sow. I mean, they were coming down, coming, filling the altar with money. They were throwing it from the balcony. And Brother John looked at Creflo and said, uh, Creflo, you, you may want to sh shut this down. And he said, Brother Creflo said, no, no, they're fine. They're fine. Let them come, Brother John. Let them, let them do what's in their heart. He said, about that time, a 50-cent piece hit Creflo in the head. He goes, all right, that's it. <laughs> it's a good time to shut it down. Are you ready to give? If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand. Hallelujah. Been a powerful weekend. It's been life changing. It's been church changing. Whew. My goodness, what a God. <laughs> Give you just a different. Uh, my wife and I served the Lord very powerfully many years in non charismatic circles. And we had the power of the Holy Spirit. But when I got filled with the Spirit, I found something else, the power of the Holy Ghost. There's something about the Holy Ghost. I just tell you, and that has been, you're fortunate that if, if you've been in it all along, but it was such a startling thing to me whenever I came out of that many years of pastoring, built a large church, 26... 2,600 people years and years ago in Denver, one of the biggest churches in the West, and uh, did not have the fullness of the Spirit. And when I got filled with the Holy Ghost was more impacting to me than when I got born again. More impacting. Amen. So you enjoy the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Uh, Let me ask you, what would you say? Brother John looked at you and said, can I say something? Let me pray about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's get the whole worship team up. <laughs> I think they're ready. What do you think? <laughs> Hallelujah. Because this is what I want us to do. I want you to put your seed in. Brother John, and then I want us to get up and take a little time and let's rejoice like we believe it. Let's rejoice like it's already done. What? Because if it's okay, before you choose your guitar, Jason, if it's okay, that, okay, we're not going to do that one anyway. You can pick one of the other ones. But I just, I got a feeling that it just might get loud. I mean, it's just a feeling. I, I don't know if, it's, if it'll get loud out there, but I know it's going to get loud up here. And so ushers come. Father, we thank you. We thank you for bringing this ground before us. And Father, we bring our best seed. We've listened, and now we're obeying. And we thank you. That as we put seed into this ground, all this ground knows to do is to produce harvest. And your word declares that it's automatic. And so we thank you for the honor, for the opportunity to put our seed into this ground. And we thank you for the harvest coming back to us on every wave. We thank you for the calling on this church, on this ministry, that we will take care of your men and women of God. That when they come here, they are blessed. They are refreshed. They are renewed. And they are blessed beyond measure. We thank you for that honor that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So after you've sown your seed, stand up. Huge altar area up here. They saw you come in. You might as well act like the rest of us. Excuse me for
to sing It might not be on key But it's from my heart No one else can tell it What the Lord has done for me And this might take all day So I better start right now And it might get Got a halo. No, I'm not a perfect man. Oh, I'm just glad to be a child of God. I think of where I could have been, should have been, would have been if he hadn't stepped in. Oh, I got a praise on the inside that can't be denied. I got a let it out.
Hallelujah. Never the same. Never, ever the same. Glory be to God. Only one thing to do now. Good Christians will go eat. But we're going to call it fellowship. So go fellowship with some people of like precious faith. I love you. You prosper in me and help. Don't make this, well, that was a good weekend. Uh-uh. Never going back. Never another day of lack. I'm never going back. Always more than enough. I'm never going back. All sufficiency and abounding to every good work. I'm never going back. Never. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go home. Hallelujah.